So of course, what I am doing now could totally be an exercise sheet. On the other hand, I uh, like to have it on video so that we can all watch it later and, um, and use the examples. So the f this is, uh, now I forgot, is it chapter 1.8? Example in Schwinger parameters. The one loop self energy. We need momentum assignments for the one loop self energy. Momentum P flows in. At the bottom line, we have P plus K. At the top line, K flows back. And now we first write down the original integral, which is an integral over K with the denominator P plus K square minus M square times k square minus m square, and of course plus i epsilon in each propagator. So let's call the denominators d1 times d2. We have two denominator factors for the two propagators. And what does it mean to Schwinger parameterize the loop integral? Schwinger parameters were the parameters where each propagator is taken into an exponential integral as a Gaussian integral, in fact. So then we have an integral over k. And for each propagator independently, we have an integral over one Schwinger parameter called alpha 1 and alpha 2. So, and so we should also denote the lines. So this lower line is the line number 1, which gets the Schwinger parameter alpha 1. This gets alpha 2. And then we have here the two integrals. For each uh, propagator, we get a minus i factor from the parametrization. And then we get e to the power of i times sum over di times alpha i. That's the simple result. So we have this linear combination of the denominators in the exponential. Okay, so what we now need to do is to evaluate the loop integral over k. And as you saw the last time, the loop integral is a Gaussian integral because the exponent depends on k square. However, in contrast to the last time, it doesn't only depend on k square, it depends on p plus k square and on k square. And therefore, we need to do uh, something similar to Feynman parameters, we need to rearrange it, complete the square, and do some uh, loop momentum replacements. So let's go through this. So the sum di times alpha i is actually the following. Let's once write it out completely. P plus k square times alpha 1 plus k square times alpha 2. Then for each propagator, we have minus m square and plus i epsilon. So the minus, sorry, minus times minus is plus. So for each propagator, we have this. And so this factor simply comes times the sum of the two alpha i's. Minus m square times alpha 1, minus m square times alpha 2, and the same for i epsilon. OK. Let's prepare for this completing the square business. So we write it as k square times something plus k times something plus something else. So what is the coefficient of k square? k square comes here, k square comes here. So the coefficient of k square is alpha 1 plus alpha 2. What is the coefficient of k? The coefficient of k comes from here p plus k, uh, p dot k times 2 times alpha 1. So we have 2k dot p times alpha 1. And 
then we have the rest and the rest contains p squared times alpha 1. And this business here, this uh, mass and epsilon business is kind of, uh, it goes for itself. This is always uh, just uh, a byproduct. It doesn't change here in the course of our calculation. Now, in order to generalize it later, let us maybe write this in a systematic form. So we have k squared times some coefficient m plus 2k times some coefficient capital J plus some constant k minus that stuff over there which always goes by itself, let's say minus k prime. This is the structure. So, and uh, let's not write the definition. So m is alpha 1 plus alpha 2, j is uh, p alpha 1 and so on. So now let's complete the square. Then this whole thing becomes, so now completing the square is a little bit more difficult uh, because k square doesn't have coefficient one. Previously it always had coefficient one, now it doesn't. So we can say k minus, uh, sorry, plus uh, m to the power minus one times j square times m. So if we take that square, then we get k square times m and uh, k dot j times two and the m cancels. And we get something additional, namely we need to subtract minus j square times m to the minus one. And then we have collected these two terms. So we need plus k minus k prime. Okay, so then we have completed the square. And so we can call this a new integration momentum k prime. This is just shifted. So the integration measure doesn't change. But we can now also define a new overall integration momentum which absorbs the m. If we absorb the m, then the integration measure changes. So we, this is a square. So k prime square times m we replace by k double prime square. Now, let's look at the integration measures. d d k original is the same as d d k prime, since that is just shifted or translated. And how does it relate to d d k double prime? So now, for each component of the momentum, we do a scaling by square root of m. And there are d components. So we get square root of m to the power d as a relative factor. So that means m to the power minus d over 2. That is the change of the integration measure. All right, but then we have here something k double prime square plus a constant which doesn't depend on k double prime. Let's go back to the Feynman diagram. The Feynman diagram is now the integral over k double prime and alpha one and two. And uh, the integration measure has changed, so we get this factor m to the power minus d over two. And the rest is not changed. We get minus i to the power two times the exponential. And the exponential is uh, whatever we have now calculated. So the exponential is e to the i times here, k double prime square minus the rest, j square m to the minus one plus k minus k prime. So, and now the loop integration over k double prime is trivial because the loop integration is just a completely standard Gaussian integral with no modification whatsoever. So, we can directly plug in the result that we obtained the last time. And this gives just a standard factor mu to the power d0 minus d times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 
times i to the power one minus d over two. That is the prefactor coming from the one loop integration of this Gaussian integral. So it's basically the same as for the master formula up to this strange power of i. But then the rest is copied minus i square. And then we have the alpha integral, integral over alpha. And the integrand of the alpha integral now contains this m to the power minus d over two times the exponential of the rest. This is completely unaffected by the loop integration. So we get e to the i times the rest and let me abbreviate the rest by w. So w is the rest, so let's write it. w is equal to the rest minus j square m to the minus one plus k minus k prime. So going back, we have reduced our one loop integral to a standard prefactor times an alpha integral. We have two Feynman uh, Schwinger parameters, alpha one and two, and the integrand of the alpha integral contains something to the power minus d over two and an exponential, and the exponential uh, is now abbreviated and we should look what this actually is. I have introduced the abbreviations and uh, in order to uh, zoom out a little bit and not uh, get bothered with all the details. But now we should look at the details, how this actually behaves as a function of the alphas. So let us analyze the exponent. So the exponent can be written also as a fraction. So in the denominator we have m, and then in the numerator we have minus j square plus k times m. Uh, actually, let me not look at the full w, because as I said before, this k prime was the thing with m square and i epsilon. This never changes, uh, so let's not look at it. We know what it is and uh, we don't need to analyze it. Let's only analyze the other stuff. So without the K prime, then it's not the full W. Only this. What is this actually? Actually, do you prefer this uh, uh, half? Uh, of the blackboard, or do you prefer equations which really extend over the full width of the blackboard? I mean, it feels really, it hurts me if, if I, you know, have to write it like this. Uh, On a tablet, we could now click and push this here. So here I have to write it once again. Minus j square plus k times m. So you can cut this out of the video. So this is now the headline. And uh, this is what we analyze. So while discussing the shape of the equation, you probably could already calculate it. What is actually j? j was p times alpha one. So we have minus p square times alpha one square. k is p square times alpha one. And what is actually m? m is alpha one plus alpha two. So here we have times alpha one plus alpha two. Okay, now we can simplify this a little bit. Let's do it here. Alpha one plus alpha two. What is actually happening in the numerator? Alpha one square, alpha one square happens to cancel. So what remains is just P square alpha one alpha two. 
So alpha 1, alpha 2 in the numerator, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 in the denominator. So let's write some facts here. So first of all, we see the numerator is quadratic in the momentum. The denominator is dimensionless. So this is the first thing we can notice. So the whole thing, the exponent is dimensionful. Uh, actually, it's not because the alphas are also dimensionful, uh, but uh, it con it's this, uh, okay, therefore this is actually, sorry, this is not correct because the alphas are of course dimensionful since alpha times a denominator is dimensionless, but it's quadratic in momenta. Uh, divided by something momentum independent. That is the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is the alphas. So here in the numerator we have two powers of alpha. So it's uh, what is this? A polynomial in the alphas of second degree. Actually, uh, only of second degree. How is this called? It's homogeneous in alpha of second degree. And this is homogeneous in the alphas of first degree. So we have something proportional to alpha i square divided by something proportional to alpha i to the power one. And the whole fraction scales like alpha to the power one. And uh, then, indeed, both numerator and denominator are polynomials in alpha of these degrees. Let us give these polynomials a nice name. They are called in the literature u and v, curly u and curly v. So these are well-known standard polynomials, u and v, the so-called semantic polynomials. So as you can guess, each Feynman diagram has two semantic polynomials which correspond to the numerator and the denominator of this exponent in Schwinger parametrization. And now we have calculated the semantic polynomials for this graph and they are simple. P square alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Let us use this to analyze the behavior of the alpha integral. So now the loop has been rearranged into an alpha integral over two alphas and the integrand has the structure of a polynomial to some um, arbitrary power and an exponential function and the exponential is the ratio of the two semantic polynomials. So how does such an integral behave? of the alpha one and two integral. Let us first look at the upper limit where all the alphas go to infinity. So by the way, just to remind you, the alpha integration always goes from zero to infinity. So it has a definite lower limit and uh, uh, infinity is the upper limit. So what happens if the alphas all go to infinity? If the alphas all go to infinity, then we see the semantic polynomials behave like alpha square and alpha. Therefore, the ratio goes like alpha to infinity. So the exponent goes to infinity and therefore we get an exponential suppression. Exponential suppression or damping. And therefore the integral is convergent. No matter what the details are, at the upper limit of the alpha integration, we never have a problem. What happens at finite alpha i? So bigger than zero, uh, but not infinite. Then the question is uh, whether the integrand has any singularities in the integration region, and it cannot. By the way, I didn't write this down, but um, I could have written it here. So uh, let me add it here. The denominator 
is a polynomial in alpha of degree one, but all the coefficients in the polynomial have uh, are positive. They are actually all one. They are, they are unit coefficients with positive coefficients. That means what happens if alpha is non-zero, then the denominator is never zero because the coefficients are all uh, unity and the alphas are all positive, therefore the denominator can never go to zero. So this, what we called V, is always uh, bigger than zero, therefore the integrand is always finite. Therefore, in the interior of the integration region, we also never have a problem. So, and by the way, the notation has, uh, we have now two notations, m is equal to our v. So, the m is the same as v here, and uh, so also this v appears here to some arbitrary uh, power, but it never goes to zero, it's always positive and therefore raised to an arbitrary power, it never creates a problem for our integral. Therefore, if there is any problem, it can be only at alpha equals zero. So now we have to look at uh, what happens at alpha going to zero. What happens at alpha going to zero? So at alpha going to zero, uh, what happens to our ratio u over v? So alpha one times alpha two divided by alpha one plus alpha two. So if uh, so, the only problem could be if alpha one and alpha two simultaneously go to zero, then the denominator vanishes. But then, for sure, the numerator vanishes even faster. That means uh, the ratio never has a singularity. U over v has no singularity. Okay, what is left? The only thing that is left is this thing here, this innocent looking m to the power minus d over two. That is the only thing which can give a problem. So let's look at this remaining uh, factor. The only potential problem is the integral over the alphas at the lower limit of this m to the power minus d over two, or in other words, this is now integral over v to the power minus d over two. Okay, and this we can look at uh, explicitly. So we have d alpha one, d alpha two of alpha one plus alpha two to the power minus d over two. So how can we analyze this? One simple way to analyze it is we know alpha one and two both need to go to zero. So one easy thing is polar coordinates. So let's do, let's say, polar coordinates in this alpha space. That means we just have uh, zero d alpha times alpha. So polar coordinates in the alpha space, and then this is just uh, alpha times some angles in this alpha space to the power minus d over two. But this is the radial uh, integral in this alpha space, and at a lower limit of that, we might have a problem. So what is this integral? This is a normal integral of a rational uh, variable, and uh, this gives a divergence if uh, in view of power counting. So this has a naive power counting behavior. So if the exponent overall of alpha is zero or bigger, we have a divergence, otherwise the thing is finite at the lower limit. So um, this is divergent. Uh, if and only if two minus d over two is uh, either smaller or bigger than zero.
dx over x uh, at zero. You can delete this from the video later, but when is this divergent? So the, uh, at the lower limit is the opposite at, as the upper limit. X to the... Uh, do you know? I think you should know. You are students. You had just uh, one year ago, you had mathematics. So it should be less than one, right? I don't know. Zero. Yeah. Maybe. Probably. I, uh, I hope. So, for example, dx over square root of x at uh, the lower limit is convergent. And dx over x over x square at the lower limit is divergent. So actually maybe we can calculate the integral. The integral is 1 over x at uh, 0. This is divergent. And this integral is square root of x. So this is convergent. So the power must be Big. Ah, the bigger the power, the better at the lower limit. Yes, that's the point. The bigger the power, the better. So this must be smaller or equal than zero. Then we have a divergence. So the alpha integral is divergent uh, if this relationship is fulfilled. And that is, of course, equivalent to d bigger or equal than 4. So this corresponds exactly to the power counting of the original diagram because power counting would tell us the thing has four powers of loop momentum in the denominator. Therefore, power counting uh, says it diverges if we have at least four dimensions. Otherwise, it diverges, uh, it's convergent. And we get the same thing back here. That means we have understood more or less, uh, that uh, the lower limit of the alpha integration, which can diverge in view of this uh, m to the power minus d over 2, if it diverges, it corresponds to ultraviolet divergences of the original loop integral. When you see the same criterion happens here. So let me just squeeze this here into a small box. This corresponds to the ultraviolet power counting. And uh, so this alpha 1 plus alpha 2 to the power minus d over 2 which appears there, which is the origin of this potential divergence. This uh, graphically corresponds to the fact. Why do we have alpha 1 plus alpha 2, by the way? If we go back, 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 alpha 1 plus alpha 2. This alpha 1 plus alpha 2 was the coefficient of k square in the overall Schwinger parametrization. So what we are counting here is actually which propagators contain k square? And then we add all the alphas for those propagators. That is where the alpha 1 plus alpha 2 came from. And so we have here these two propagators, 1 and 2. Both contain k square. And that is why we have exactly this object in our integral. And so these two propagators exactly give us the power counting, which leads to the original divergence. And the alpha 1 plus alpha 2 here correspond to the same divergence. And so you see that this power counting directly reflects which alphas appear, and uh, the same power counting relationship is obtained in the end. So this is how uh, all this manifests itself in Schwinger parametrization. And since this is quite, uh, let's say, new, I wanted to go through it explicitly so that we just develop over time some intuition of these Schwinger parameters. And uh, since I didn't want to ask again, I will just go on and 
do the integral completely. This takes three minutes. And then you see uh, what happens if we do the integral explicitly in Schwinger parameters. So let us do actually the computation after we have understood the structure. In the computation, we now uh, go back to this expression here, this expression uh, with the integrand over alpha 1 and alpha 2. We have the semantic polynomial to some power and uh, IW, the ratio of semantic polynomials to in the exponent. And uh, so in order to evaluate the integral, now we make some clever substitutions which make the integral easy. And those substitutions are again typical substitutions that you could uh, familiarize yourself with. So we take one overall alpha, which is alpha 1 plus alpha 2. So this is then the sum of all the alphas. And we take one ratio variable. Let's take alpha 1 divided by alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Then this goes from 0 to infinity. And if this goes to 0, then we get the UV divergence. And that goes from 0 to 1. Okay, then if we do that, then our uh, exponent w, uh, which was this here, um, becomes now the following. So the exponent w uh, was here. Basically, this was the final expression. So if we do the substitution, then first of all, we can factor out everywhere one overall alpha. And then the whole thing is uh, proportional to alpha. And then we get here ratio variables, beta, 1 minus beta, 1. So we get alpha times p squared times beta times 1 minus beta. And then uh, we get also this uh, minus m squared plus i epsilon. And that was always multiplied with alpha 1 plus alpha 2. So we can also just factor out the alpha from there. And then uh, that's our full exponent. And so now, uh, magically, but not accidentally, what this is, is exactly minus alpha times the q, uh, this q uh, function, which appeared if we did Feynman parametrization of the same um, two-point function. When we did Feynman parametrization, then we went through Feynman parameters and we ended up with a polynomial in Feynman parameters, which was exactly the same polynomial, only we called the thing x instead of beta. But it was exactly this square bracket. So let's say this is the Q of section 1.3. Therefore, we can evaluate the integral and this object becomes now all the prefactors, mu to the power d0 minus d, 4 pi to the power minus d over 2, times i to the power 1 minus d over 2, times minus i square. And then we have an integral alpha from 0 to infinity. And uh, from the integration measure here, we get d beta, or d alpha 1, d alpha 2. We get an additional power of alpha from the integration measure. Then integral 0 to 1, d beta. And then uh, the integrand is what? m to the power minus d over 2. But m is now simply alpha. So we get alpha to the power minus d over 2. And uh, we get the exponent e to the power minus i alpha times this q function, which is a function of beta. And then we can do the alpha integral. The alpha integral is now um, a gamma function. This gives a gamma function because we have alpha uh, times alpha to some power times an exponential with alpha. So this is directly the definition of a gamma function. 
So let's first write down all the factors d0 minus d, 4 pi minus d over 2 times i, 1 minus d over 2 minus i square. Then which gamma function do we get? Gamma function of uh, the power of the alpha um, plus 1. So we get gamma of 2 minus d over 2. And you should by now be familiar with the appearance of this gamma function here. But then we get also still the integral over beta from 0 to 1. And we have a substitution to make. In order to get a gamma function integral, of course, we need to substitute alpha by i alpha q. And so, um, therefore, we get an additional power uh, from this uh, substitution, which is 1 over i times q to the appropriate power. So what is the appropriate power? It is uh, this 2 minus d over 2. Okay, but now we are done. That's the result because what we have now is exactly the same result that we obtained in Feynman parameters. We have exactly the same prefactors. The i's metrically cancel out i to this stupid power divided by i to almost the same power up to 1i times minus i squared gives just exactly 1 overall i, like in Feynman parameters. Then all the prefactors are the same as in Feynman parameters. The gamma function is the same, and what remains is an integral over the Feynman parameter from 0 to 1. And the integral, uh, integrand is q of beta, the Feynman parameter polynomial to this, this power. So this is exactly the absolutely identical expression as we had over there. That means we know how to do the calculation in Schwinger parameters. It is definitely more involved than using Feynman parameters. We need many, many more steps. But we can generalize this to arbitrary Feynman diagrams. And uh, in the general case, there is not much difference in the level of difficulty between Feynman parameters and Schwinger parameters. What is nice about Schwinger parameters is that for each propagator, you have one unconstrained integral over alpha. In the Feynman parameters, the simplification comes from the delta function, which is a constraint. So the sum of all Feynman parameters is always one. This is, of course, nice. But uh, this constraint means that the integrals are not all independent. And here we have many independent alpha integrals and uh, can do um, the analysis of the convergence behavior in a nice way. OK, so this uh, ends the discussion of um, the Schwinger parameters at one loop. And now we will do very quickly the Schwinger parameters for a two-loop diagram. Okay, let's hurry up. So, we need Schwinger parametrization for a Feynman diagram with five propagators. Let's enumerate the propagators one, two, three, uh, four, five with the same momentum assignment as before. Then we have the loop integration over five propagators, d1 up to d5. And we can introduce Schwinger parameters for each propagator. We get minus i for each propagator. Then the loop integration. And we get five alpha integrals, d alpha 1 to alpha 5 from 0 to infinity. And the exponent is this. Now what we need is this linear combination of the denominators, which is the following p plus q, and I neglect the mass now again, alpha 1 plus q square alpha 2 plus alpha 3 plus q plus k square alpha 4 plus k square alpha 5 minus i epsilon 
times the sum of all the alphas. And these are just uh, each propagator written down. Uh, so Q square are these two propagators and Q plus K is that propagator and the other one is K. Now, uh, in order to save time, what you need to do is to write this as a quadratic form in the loop momenta. Now we don't have one loop momentum, but we have two loop momenta. So we write it as a quadratic form. Let me write it like this. Q comma K times a matrix times Q and K and plus some J transpose times Q and K times two plus a constant minus this constant prime, which we also had the last time. Now, if we now look at this, what is this matrix M? What is the matrix M? So the one one entry of the matrix is the coefficient of the loop momentum Q square. Where is Q square? Q square is here in the first propagator, in the second and third propagator, and in the fourth propagator. So here in this entry, we have alpha one plus two plus three plus four. Let's write it like this. Then the coefficient of K square goes here into this matrix entry. K square appears only in the fourth propagator and in the fifth one. So we have here alpha four plus five. Then what are the off diagonal elements of the matrix? These are the coefficients of K dot Q. Where is K dot Q? It's here. K dot Q times alpha four. So we have it twice, alpha four here and alpha four here. Then we have symmetrized the matrix. That is the matrix of this quadratic form in the loop momenta. Then we have our J, which is the linear term in the loop momenta. What is a linear term in the loop momentum? Here we have P dot Q times two alpha. So the two is already there. So P dot Q, so we have here P times alpha one. And uh, we have K dot P, we don't have. And uh, anything else which is linear? No. So our J is just this. This is the only linear term. Then our constant K, which is the rest independent of loop momenta, we have P squared times alpha one. And nothing else. So but in this way, we have already written our um, integral as a quadratic form in the loop momenta, and we can do exactly the same spiel as before. Let's call this as a generalized two-dimensional loop momentum L. Then we have just L transpose times M times L. And uh, we can complete the square. So this is L transpose times M times L. If we complete the square, then we can write this. How can we write it? We can write it as, um, we can write it as L plus M to the power minus one times J transpose times M times L plus M to the power minus one times J. Right, because then we get L transpose M times L, we get uh, L times uh, J plus J transpose times L, and uh, we get something additional. Minus J transpose M to the power minus one times J plus the rest K minus K prime. Done. Okay, bye. Yeah. All right, but then uh, we can, of course, do a variable substitution. L goes to L prime by a shift, and then we have L prime transpose M.